We're going to begin this evening in Proverbs chapter 2. We will be going right through the text verse by verse, gleaning some points, not going super in-depth with the chapter, but we want to establish that God's Word tells us what wisdom looks like. It gives us the benefits of wisdom and uh, the value of that wisdom. So as we begin that, it, the, the entirety of the message is titled, The Way of Wisdom, and Proverbs 2, we're looking at as wisdom for living. In the very most general of senses, this wisdom provides for us what we need for life in a variety of ways. We can look at that term. Let's look at the first two verses of Proverbs 2. There we read, my son. You, of course, remember that the book of Proverbs is written by Solomon to his son. And so where you see son, if you're a daughter, you can read daughter because it has the same application. It is farther than Solomon's notes to his son, God's word to us. And so whether we are male or female, it has equal application. Verse 1, my son, if you receive my words and treasure up my commandments with you, making your ear attentive to wisdom and inclining your heart to understanding, and then we continue with that thought. But we just want to draw, to draw out a few of these thoughts as we go along, rather than read too much and then not remember what was said. So take a note there of what is being said in these verses, the need to receive the word, to treasure up the commandments, to make our ear attentive, to incline our heart toward understanding what God wants us to know. So all of this is talking about the value of wise counsel. Here it is a an earthly father to his son, but it is also our heavenly father to each of us as his spiritual offspring. The first thing that's noted for a young person is the need to receive parental instruction. Part of the fall places a, a hostility many times between parent and child. To where a child, especially as teen years are uh, encountered, begins to think that they know enough to do it on their own and they don't need mom and dad always climbing up their case to you know, tell them this and that and the other. That's a normal part of growing up and yet it needs to be curbed. Scripture says receive sound parental instruction. There is value in receiving our parents' instruction. I thank the Lord that as I grew up, I don't remember ever having a rebellious tendency toward my parents. I didn't always agree with them. But it didn't mean that I felt like they were stupid, you know, the old expression. I was amazed at how wise my dad got the older I got. Uh, it's not that God, dad got any wiser, it's that you began to listen actually to what was being said. Uh, I never really went through that. I don't have that, re that remembrance, and that is the grace of God. But also there is the note here, not only receiving parental instruction, but also treasuring up right commands. So this idea of treasuring is to treat the commands against which we chafe many times, you tell me I can't do this, but I want to do that. You tell me I must do this, and I don't want to do that. These we are to treasure because there is value in the command. There's value in the order, in the responsibility that that puts upon each of us to obey. In verse 2, it talks about developing an ear for wisdom to where you really want to hear wise counsel. And none of us should get to the point where we feel like we're wise in and of ourselves and don't need counsel. And then having a heart directed toward understanding. You see, this is much more than just simply obeying a list of do's and don'ts. It's conditioning our inner person, our soul, our spirit, to really desire wisdom. Scripture says that foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child, that that's the way we come into the world, and that foolishness needs to be driven out. And one of the ways it's driven out is by wisdom. That is the easier way. The other way Scripture speaks of is the rod of correction. And that is also necessary. 
Then in verses 3 and 4, some other notes about wisdom. Yes, if you call out for insight and raise your voice for understanding, if you seek it like silver and search for it as for hidden treasures. In these two verses, there is the intensity of the desire for wisdom. And truly, a person who does not desire wisdom will not acquire wisdom. You have to want it. Because again, the foolishness is a part of who we are. So this section, oh, I forgot to hit that verse, sorry about that, there it is. It's telling us that we need to dedicate ourselves to finding wisdom. Make it something that is very important. It talks in verse 3 about calling out for wisdom. That is, you could say, calling out to God, calling out to wise counselors, asking and asking with that true desire to have the answer. Because we all know what it is to have someone ask us a question that they don't want to hear the answer to. They only ask because of formality. This is asking with the intensity of, I must have this. I must have wisdom. And then seeking for wisdom as, as if it were a treasure. You think of how much money people spend on things, gadgets, like uh, a metal detector. To go out and find someone else's thrown away treasures. Now, if anyone here has a metal detector, Joe has one or had one, and he was using it for productive things like finding our property corners, and I appreciate that, Joe. But many people that go out with their metal detector find nuts and bolts and screws, <laughs> things that really don't have much value. But if we really had an appreciation for wisdom and sought for it like it were a treasure, the certainty of Scripture is that we will find wisdom when we have that attitude. Verses 5 through 8 direct us to the focus or the source of that wisdom in these words, Then, when you search with this kind of intensity, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. For the Lord gives wisdom, from his mouth comes knowledge and understanding. He stores up wisdom, sound wisdom, for the upright. He is a shield to those who walk in integrity, guarding the paths of justice and watching over the way of his saints. So the source of all wisdom is God. And this is not just exclusive to Proverbs chapter 2 or to the book of Proverbs in general. We find this all throughout Scripture. It is really the basis of the writing of Scripture, that there is wisdom beyond our ability, and beyond our knowledge that comes only from God. And true wisdom always leads us to know God. It is not wisdom that leads us away from God. That is foolishness. That is sophistry. Sophistry is that which appears to be wisdom but is a sad fraud. It's the iron pyrite of the wisdom world. Because God's word, his words are ultimate wisdom. What God says to us in his word is the, the highest pinnacle of wisdom. There was also mentioned in these verses, especially in verse seven, verses 7 and 8, the mention of the word shield and guarding and so forth, the idea that God protects those who seek wisdom. Because wisdom provides that protection. God is interested in our acquiring it and helps us along in that process. Now, the balance of the chapter, verses 9 through 22, I'll fit into one category that we'll call enjoying the rewards of wisdom, but we'll break it down into several verses at a time. First of all, verses 9, 10, and 11. Then you will understand righteousness and justice and equity, every good path. For wisdom will come into your heart and knowledge will be pleasant to your soul. Discretion will watch over you. Understanding will guard you. So what are the rewards of wisdom? First of all, in verse 9, those rewards are described as the understanding of righteousness, justice, and equity. Now, we're not primarily concerned in this text with these 
ideas in their spiritual sense, but rather in the sense of right now. Righteousness in the sense of right living before God and man, knowing how to make right decisions. And the book of Proverbs is loaded with good, sound advice on how to make certain decisions. It tells us things that we shouldn't do, and it tells us things that we had better do. The justice being spoken of here is a fair treatment for myself and others, having a right idea of what justice looks like, because each of us tends to warp justice and think that justice is whatever favors me. Uh, Justice sometimes does not favor me because I've been foolish, and I need to understand the rightness of that justice which comes to bring me hard times when I've earned them. And then there is equity, which I'll describe as even-handedness, knowing how to treat one another in a fair manner, an even-handed manner. These are important to get through life. On a job, these things are important. The more wisdom you have, the less trouble you are likely to have, at least from your own stupidity standpoint. There can be and always will be individuals trying to make trouble. Verse 10, which again said that wisdom will come into your heart, knowledge will be pleasant to your soul, describes the fact that wisdom and knowledge to the person who really wants wisdom become pleasing to our souls. And this idea of the soul is that it's not just a quick fix. It's not just what's convenient for me right now but rather true wisdom and true knowledge sink down in and give a sense of inner satisfaction. Yes, a sense of spiritual satisfaction when that wisdom is derived from God. And then verse 11, which talked about the guarding effect of discretion. Again, that discretion and understanding will be a protection for us. This motif is repeated from verse 8, verses 7 and 8 really, And here comes in again as one of the rewards of wisdom. We can expect certain protection. Because as we learn what wisdom is from God, there are certain activities and certain decisions which we're not going to make. No, I wouldn't do that. Why? Because that's contrary to what God's wisdom is. So if we make wisdom that important in our lives, it can be a great source of blessing to us. Verses 12 through 15 then, delivering you, another benefit of wisdom, it's delivering you from the way of evil, from men of perverted speech, who forsake the paths of uprightness to walk in the ways of darkness, who rejoice in doing evil and delight in in the perverseness of evil, men whose paths are crooked and who are devious in their ways." So let's state the point. This is talking of the fact that wisdom will give us deliverance from evil, perverted, and deceptive men or women. It cuts both ways. We'll get to women in just a moment, but the point of this is that as we walk through life, there are frequently individuals trying to take advantage of us. And it is the wise person who understands human nature And God's word enough to be able to figure out where the evil, where the perversity, and where the deception lies. And this is, frankly, one of the problems of youth. Without the experience to go on, to draw on, young people are more easily lured by some of these deceptions And so the wisdom is all that much more important because you don't have the background of experience to be able to see through the sham, the lie, to see what's perverted. That word perverted means twisted. Not just in a moral sense, it could involve that. But anything that is of a twisted nature, in other words, it's not really what it suggests itself to be. And then verses 16 through 19, 
Wisdom will also have this effect. You will be delivered from the forbidden woman, the strange woman, as it says in the King James Version. I heard this defined very aptly, and that is any woman that is not your own. That's the strange or the forbidden woman. In this case, it's more of the prostitute. But it's not just that. It's the idea of seduction. And this can go both directions, of course. Again, Solomon's writing to his son. So we could talk about the forbidden man just as easily. From the adulteress with her smooth words, who forsakes the companion of her youth and forgets the covenant of her God. For her house sinks down to death, her paths to the departed. None who go to her come back, nor do they regain the paths of life. Those are some very solemn warnings. This is not something to be taken casually. And of course, the idea of one's moral purity being a gift from God that you don't get to get back once it's lost or once it's surrendered, that's the idea here. Don't be duped by someone who says they love you when what they're really saying is, I love me and how you will make me feel. That's not love. Scripture describes love, of course, the quintessent example, John 3, verse 16, the Father loving us so much that he gives his Son to die for us, or as it's said in Romans, that a, one, that a man would give his life for his friend, or in the marriage bond, that a man love his wife as Christ loved the church, a self-sacrificing love. A love that is true love and is demonstrated by the fact that it wants only the best for the one who is loved. And that is frequently not what you see in society. As men, we are frequently seduced just by the sight of our eyes. And it doesn't matter what our age. We can be seduced by the forbidden woman. But women, be aware that there are the seductive males out there, and of course, the entertainment industry features them prominently. And uh, it just really develops an attitude in the mind of many young ladies that they're looking for this person of great outward beauty without considering what the heart is like. We'll get to that in just a few moments when we talk about wisdom for marriage. That's the next section, but we're not there yet, so let's not jump ahead. The deliverance then from the seductive woman, sorry, I didn't have that last verse shown there, uh, from the seductive woman and just understanding the fact that there are those who would gladly destroy your life and walk away laughing. They're in it for what they can get out of it. They're in relationships just for what they can get out of conquest. So we need to be wise. Verses 20 through 22. So you will walk in the way of the good. Contrast entirely from the path of the evil ones that is being talked about. So you will walk in the way of the good and keep the paths of the righteous, for the upright will inhabit the land, and those with integrity will remain in it. But the wicked will be cut off from the land, and the treacherous will be rooted out of it. So here we have the other side of the equation, that wisdom brings freedom to walk correctly and securely. You think of the... Seduction that's been talked about, not just in the seductive woman, but also the, the men who would seek to deceive and to twist another individual. You get involved in that and the feeling of guilt will be overwhelming. But the way of wisdom leads to a freedom. What a freedom it is to know that you have not been violating God's word and God's law. To know that you've been walking wisely gives you a sense of confidence, security to go through life. And that's what we have here in verses 20 through 22 as one of the ultimate, you might say, good thing about wisdom in this life. 
And before we get into everything else, let me just make this statement that I think is equally uh, appropriate with the idea of wisdom, and that is that God is more concerned with who you and I are than what career we have. Because you can be in the most laudable career of all if you have not the character to be there. You'll be a discredit to that position. We always start with what we are, who we are. It is important to be saved by the grace of Jesus Christ. It is important to know wisdom as Scripture informs us of it. So now we're going to apply some principles of wisdom to practical areas of living the Christian life. And I'm directing it toward the teens of our congregation, perhaps more so than the adults, but it applies. You know, you can see each of these points of wisdom. The reason we've come to this point, you remember as we started out our study on the will of God, we looked at all of these statements that are being made by individuals of rather uh, impressive credentials, shall we say. I mean, they've sold millions of books, and so if on that, on that totem, if nothing else, you're not supposed to listen to me, you're supposed to listen to them because they've sold all the books, right? But they're teaching something that is contrary to Scripture. They're teaching something that Scripture just plainly does not teach. And what I've been advocating for throughout the study is the fact that God gives us the wisdom in his word to make many of these decisions and he simply expects us to utilize that wisdom. So let's look in the area of marriage, how we could make an application of wisdom. What God says about selecting a marriage partner. I think the first and most important thing is that we each have become the godly responsible person that we would like to find another to be. If it doesn't start there, then it, the search is in vain, isn't it? If you want someone else to be good enough to pull you up, uh, that's, you're going to pull them down. So each of us must take responsibility for our own lives. The second piece of advice that I would have is that each of us needs to find our fulfillment in God and not expect for a moment that we could find our fulfillment in a fallen creature. A wife or a husband will never take the place of God without becoming an idol and being a curse to you. Each of us is to find our fulfillment in God. Scripture makes the uh, observation that no one can fill the void that God intends to fill in your life. That should be self-evident. And as we'll look here in the book of Colossians in chapter 2, contentment begins with this knowledge of our completeness in Christ. Look at these two verses with me, if you will. In him, that is in Christ, the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. And you have been filled in him or completed in him who is the head of all rule and authority. It's interesting that the word in verse 9 for fullness has the same root as the word filled as it's translated in verse 10. So as Christ has within him the fullness of deity, you can't be that, you can't have that without being God, that fullness of deity then comes to those of us who trust in him. Notice again how verse 9 begins, in him. So when we're in Christ by faith, by repentance and trusting him for salvation, then we can be filled with his fullness. And that's an important thing to understand and to live out. That in Christ, I do not depend on anything or anyone else to complete me outside of Christ. Now, there is a completing role that happens for the man and the woman involved in marriage, but that only happens as God is our fullness first. Again, a person cannot take the place of God. And then there are biblical principles from there, and we're going to support them with Scripture. The first would be don't date or even consider marrying an unsaved person. There are those individuals crazy enough to think, well, if, I, if we get married, I'll, bring, I'll win her to Christ. I'll win him to Christ. It doesn't work out that way. 
Because Scripture makes it very clear, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 39, of the widowed or uh, biblically divorced woman, she is free to be married to whom she wishes only in the Lord. So there is that provision, that phrase that says that a woman is free in this circumstance to marry whomever she will, as long as that person is a follower of Jesus Christ. We'll add a little bit more to that because it's not just enough for the person to say, oh yeah, I'm a Christian. There has to be some evidence in life. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14, the first part of that verse says, do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. And the application that is being made is very graphic if you're familiar with what a yoke is. A yoke was a device used to link two animals together so they could plow the field before John Deere invented tractors or whoever did. But the point of the matter was, if you yoked together an ox that's this high and a donkey that's this high, what's going to happen? The donkey's going to be pawing air. Or, you know, it's not going to be doing, you're going to be going in circles at the very best of circumstances. And that graphic illustration from agrarian life gives us an insight into just simply the marriage bond as well as other applications we could make. That if two, as one of the minor prophets says, are not walking in the same direction, how can they walk together unless they're agreed on what direction they're going in? It's like, we, you know, two people begin here in Hummelstown, and they're going to travel to Harrisburg. And one of them says, oh, well, they're, well, we're going to say to Pittsburgh. It's a little farther away. Okay. They're going to go to Pittsburgh. And the one guy says, okay, I'm hopping on the turnpike and heading east. And the other guy says, no, I think I'm going to hop on the turnpike and head west. Can they drive together in the same car? It's not going to work. One of them is going to get to Pittsburgh and the other one's not. So the point of the matter is that this unequal yoking, this not being in agreement on the very fundamental issues of life, what's life's, what is life's purpose, for instance? Life's purpose is to know God and enjoy Him forever. So it is absolutely essential to marry a saved person, even to date a saved person and not the unsaved But then there is a little bit more to add to this. Look for someone who delights in the Lord. Psalm 37, verse 4, Delight yourself in the Lord, and He will give you the desires of your heart. Whether you're a young man or a young lady, let me tell you that finding a person who truly delights in God is going to be the best way to happiness in a marriage relationship. If both are seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, that makes a whole lot better foundation than simply marrying for good looks or certain abilities. Here's some cautions. If a person isn't attending church before you start dating, they probably won't after you get married. Evangelistic dating is not not suggested in Scripture and is not biblical. Put another way, if a person isn't serving God before they're married, when they're still in a single state, then why will marriage change them into a person who desires to serve God? It will not. And so you need to look for someone who will be a person with whom you can serve the Lord. And 1 Peter 3 verse 7 makes this very apparent when it says, Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as to the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. So there is this necessity of serving God together and seeing the importance of that. We're also looking for someone that we can grow with. No one should think that life does not involve growth or that I'm as far advanced in this or that as I need to be. We all need to grow all the time. And both need to grow together, especially in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord. Let's make another biblical application of wisdom. You must look for someone of the opposite sex. 
needs to be said more today than ever, perhaps. Matthew 19, verses 4 and 5, Christ says, Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female and said, Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. There is a school of thought today that says Jesus Christ never spoke to the question of homosexuality. I beg to differ. This, these two verses make it very clear. He also talks about the fiery hell that fell on Sodom and Gomorrah, and, there, and there's a reason for that too. But the point of the matter is here that we need to hold fast to what the Bible teaches, not to what society teaches today. And then that person needs to be single, widowed, or biblically divorced. And we talked about the biblical divorce situation this morning, but just to refresh our minds, Matthew 5, verse 32, everyone who divorces his wife except on the ground of sexual immorality makes her commit adultery, and whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. So Scripture makes it very clear, Christ made it very clear, that the divorce has to be legitimate or the remarriage constitutes adultery. And if you weren't here this morning, I challenge you to go on YouTube, listen to the message, because there's a lot to it. I don't want to go on and redo it this evening. But the point is that you have to marry someone who is qualified to marry. The individual who thinks that uh, they're going to woo someone who is already married so that they will get a divorce so that then they can be married to this person is a person looking in the wrong direction. That's not biblical wisdom. Because if you could win them away from their marriage partner, someone else will win them from you. Simple fact. But it's also a biblical matter. You need to marry someone who's not afraid to work. There are two passages of Scripture heading in two different directions. 2 Thessalonians 3 verse 10 it says, If anyone, particularly any man, is not willing to work, let him not eat. How would that affect our society if we applied that rule? Uh, there might be a lot of hungry people, but no, hunger is a motivator. No one willingly dies of hunger. Just because they don't want to work, they'll eventually get to work. Proverbs 31 verse 13, from a woman's side of things, says she seeks wool and flax and works willingly with her hands. So a desire to work needs to be in both directions, both the man and the woman, in order for that marriage to have a chance of success. One cannot pull the weight of the other when one does not want to work. And so all of this could be summed up in, in one way, some of these things anyway. Never marry a project spouse. You know, I can fix him, I can fix her. It's a good person, just really been, had some rough times and, you know, you got to understand, but I can fix it. You, you, you'll get fixed. It won't be any fun. Proverbs chapter 5, an entire chapter really based on the idea of avoid the promiscuous or the flirtatious person. We'll not read the entirety of the text, but you don't want to find, when you're looking for a marriage partner, you don't want to find someone who is experienced in the sexual world. It always it amazes me that people say, well, we're going to live together for a while to see if it works out, to see if what exactly works out to see if you can figure out the sex thing. I mean, I'm being perhaps a little crass, and I apologize for that. But honestly, what are people thinking they're going to figure out if it'll work out? The fact of the matter is that couples that live together prior to marriage are about twice as likely to divorce as individuals who do not do so. And so Scripture makes it clear, follow what Scripture says. So another principle, avoid the person who lacks self-control. Proverbs 25, verse 28, a man without self-control is like a city broken into and left without walls. No defenses. And this goes along with the next statement, that is, avoid the angry person. Proverbs 22, verse 24, make no friendship with a man given to anger, nor go with a wrathful man. Why? Because you're going to get in trouble. You're going to be calm and cool and collected and the other individual is blowing up and you're going to suffer the consequences. 
The Bible also says avoid a quarrelsome person, Proverbs 21, verse 9. It is better to live in the corner of a housetop than in a house shared with a quarrelsome wife. Or, verse 19 of the same chapter, it is better to live in a desert than with a quarrelsome and fretful woman. That could go the other direction as well. Again, remember, Solomon is writing to his son, so he's warning him about women, but we can turn it around and make it applicable in the other direction as well. Scripture also gives us the point of wisdom to avoid foolish individuals. How do you know a person's foolish or not, though? <laughs> By the things they do. Here's, let me give you a real quick illustration of this. I was in the Department of Motor Vehicles in uh, a certain location, I won't say where, and I was hearing a conversation going on between the person behind the desk and a driver and his grandmother. And the driver in question had had his license suspended, quite obviously, from the conversation, because he had accumulated numerous traffic violations. He was always going too fast and doing stupid things. And he wanted his grandmother to pay the bill so he could get his license reinstated. When she found that it was over $900, she decided not to pay the money. I was very happy for her. I hope she maintained that solid position. I rather doubt that she did. I think he probably whittled her or will down and eventually got what he wanted. But that's a foolish person. A foolish person is one who keeps doing the same wrong thing and expecting a right result. So don't go with a foolish person. If they have a track record of getting in trouble, of losing jobs, of doing things that are just nonsensical, don't think that they're going to break that habit. Biblically, they won't. Proverbs 14, verse 7, Leave the presence of a fool, for there you do not meet words of knowledge. Or Proverbs 13, verse 20, Whoever walks with the wise becomes wise, but the companion of fools will suffer harm. Here's another principle of wisdom. Don't marry a beautiful person who lacks discretion. You know, the trophy wife, the hunk. Proverbs 11, verse 20, like a gold ring in a pig's snout is a beautiful woman without discretion. So as someone said, you might get the gold ring, but you're going to have to live with the pig. It's a graphic application. The old adage that beauty is only skin deep. And when a person thinks that their beauty is their key to unlock the world, stay away from that person. That's a beautiful person that lacks discretion. And we could make a lot of applications. I'm just throwing it out there, though. And finally, marry someone to whom you are attracted. It's always a good idea. But that's not the first thing we started with, is it? Because the reason for the attraction ought to be all of these other character qualities. Now, we could probably add a few more, and you might want to do that. But the point of the matter is, does Scripture have little, nothing or much to say about the quality of person to whom you ought to be interested in for marrying? It has a lot to say. We're down to letter Q. I didn't count how many that was, but it's more than 13. Now let's look at another thing. We'll take less time with this one. Wisdom for work. Does God tell us anything about how we should select what kind of work, what kind of job we're going to do? Yes, first of all, seek for something that's God-honoring, 1 Corinthians 10.31. Whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all for what? To the glory of God. 1, Corinthians, or 1 Timothy chapter 3 says that if a man desires the office of a bishop, that is, the office of a pastor, he desires a good thing, and God's word does not discourage him. But what then must he do if he desires that? He must qualify. He must qualify himself. The verses in 1, Corinthians, or 1 Timothy chapter 3 are all about the qualifications. It's not just from the perspective of the pulpit committee's requirements for an incoming pastoral candidate, but rather the list of character qualities that a prospective candidate ought to develop in his life or realize he's not cut out for that. And then the same thing is said of the office of deacon. 
The fact of the matter is that we're free to choose our career within certain limitations as long as we can honor God. So, here are a couple wisdom principles. Seek work that will allow family time. What was the first institution God ever created? Was it work? No, it was family. It wasn't even government. It wasn't even church. It was family. There needs to be a, a devotion to family. If you're single, okay, think about future marriage. Think about how you need to structure your life so that you are open to that leading if God chooses to lead in that way. And then seek work that will allow for church time, church ministry, as I put it here. And Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25 comes to mind, which says, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, that phrase, to meet together, could literally be translated, not neglecting the assembly. It's actually the word, uh, it, the base of the word is synagogue, and that is the basic assembly of here believers, not just Jewish people. So don't forsake assembling together in the church because that is an obligation. I like to tell people this is the 11th commandment. Uh, kind of, you know, surprises people. I thought there were only 10. So, yeah, this is another one. Thou shalt go to church, uh, a good church. Seek work that fits your interests, your gifts, your training, all of the things that you've been working for or thinking about. You know, look in that direction. Avoid work that violates God's moral will. Now, what kind of work would violate God's moral will? Anything dishonest, deceptive, immoral, or illegal? That would be a short list to start it, right? Dishonest, deceptive, immoral, illegal. Now, I include dishonest and deceptive because some things, you're not really telling a lie, you're just not telling all the truth. So you have to be careful about that kind of a job as well. Um, and then the others are self-explanatory. Avoid work that will entangle you with the world's philosophy. And here, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 3 and 4 Share in suffering as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No soldier gets entangled in civilian pursuits since his aim is to please the one who enlisted him. So the point is, you've got to dedicate your time where it needs to be. Avoid work that will present temptation to you or to others. Because 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 22 says, abstain from every form of evil. Scripture also talks about avoiding the company of fools. We looked at this verse a little earlier, Proverbs 13, verse 20. Whoever walks with wise becomes wise, but a companion of fools will suffer harm. So with these kinds of wisdom principles from a variety of Scripture texts, we may choose the work that conforms to these biblical ideals. And if we have several alternatives, we can choose the one we like best. And then wisdom for college, I would start with this point. Educate yourself whether you go to college or not. Never stop learning. It's always something to learn. And then the second point, do you really need to go to college to prepare for your career or ministry goals? Everyone needs to ana analyze that because college is not cheap. Even cheap colleges are not cheap. There is no college you can go to that you can earn enough money in a month to pay for it every month. So the likelihood is you end up in debt or putting mom and dad in debt. So you have to think about this thing. Do I need college? Is that something that is going to be helpful for me moving forward? And sometimes it is, and, I, and a person still doesn't want to do it. But you need to do what is reasonable to get to your goals. From there, I would suggest you need to seek a college that will prepare you spiritually as well as professionally. It is amazing to note the fact that many young people go off to college and have their faith destroyed. And so that's my next point. Beware of colleges which will try to destroy faith. And I literally had a parent come to me at one point and say, I'm concerned about where my daughter's going to college. The first day of the class, I forget whether it was comparative religion, philosophy, something on that order. The, the professor said, how many of you, by uplifted hand, would say that you go to church regularly? Once a week, you know, a couple times a month, but regularly. Most of the class raised their hand. Then the professor said, I hope in the course of this semester to cure you of that. Yeah, I would be concerned about that. 
Be sure you are spiritually mature before choosing a secular college. It's not that every Christian has to choose a Christian college. I think it's generally a better idea since there are Christian colleges that educate in almost any field that you want to go into. But there may be a situation and, you know, an individual can make that choice to go to a secular college, but they better be spiritually mature or these problems will show themselves and they will find themselves in a world of hurt. And then my last piece of advice, and I'm not supporting all of these with Scripture because we kind of have the other ones, but beware of spending more on education than you can comfortably afford to repay. I think it is insane for a young person to get $120,000 into debt so that they can get into a certain career, especially when you consider that probably only a quarter to a third of individuals who graduate in any particular career actually end up pursuing that career. So what would it look like with $120,000 in debt to be working at Walmart? When are you ever going to get out of it, right? Uh, you know, if, you're gonna, if you know you're going to head that direction, you don't need to get into $120,000 in debt to get that job. And then in conclusion, wisdom above all else, Scripture presents that wisdom is essential for life, Proverbs 4, verse 7. The beginning of wisdom, the foundation of wisdom is this. Get wisdom, and whatever you get, get insight. And if you're going to find that wisdom, it's always going to be found in the Word of God. We're talking about spiritual wisdom, wisdom that leads, first of all, to salvation, according to 2 Timothy 3, verse 15. And then after salvation, this walk in wisdom that we've been talking about in Ephesians 5 verse 15 tells us to look carefully to how we walk or how we live so that we end up living not as the unwise but as wise individuals. And in that source, that seeking for wisdom, we always must remember that God has never promised to reveal daily wisdom apart from his word And a key verse we've been looking at throughout this study is 2 Peter 1, verse 3. His, God's divine power, has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who has called us to his own glory and excellence. And if you look at the context, it's talking about in the word of God. We have all things that we need for life and godliness. We need everything we need to live a life that pleases God and allows us to live a life that is productive here on the worldly plane, so to speak. So these are principles of wisdom. We, can, we could go on in every area of life and find the principles of wisdom that God's Word applies to us, and I hope we will do that. Our study in the will of God will have one more message that, unless it develops into two messages, uh, I, pre- I plan to conclude it with the final, this final message or thought um, that it will be next. Uh, and it is basically looking at the idea of being consistent in our interpretation of Scripture, and that's one of the things we always have to do when we're trying to be practical in life, make sure that lines up with Scripture. So we'll take a look at that in uh, the coming week. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the wisdom that your Word has for us. We've just looked at a slice of it. There is so much more that we could consider and that we must consider from your Word. We pray that you would give us the grace to do that, the hunger, the thirst for that wisdom. And Lord, that you would grant us that wisdom as you have promised you will do. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. Ray, would you come? Final hymn.